All right, y'all turn to Romans 5. We're going to pick up in verse 12, and we're going to resume our study of the book of Romans. While y'all are turning there, I'll remind everybody, please continue to pray for Brother Chris Petty. Um, he, Wayne said he's in good spirits, and, you know, the Lord is, uh, is amazing the way He works. And so often you see someone... Uh, as our time starts drawing near, God begins working at an advanced rate. In other words, sanctification kind of upscales, you know, and the Lord begins working with us more. And I pray that's the case with Chris. And I know the Lord will keep him comfortable and, and keep him in, um, you know, it, there, there's no good way to say it, but keep him in the comfort of knowing where you're going. That's the biggest thing. Um, like Charles Spurgeon said, our people die well. And I don't mean Chris is going to die tomorrow. I just mean, hey, we're all heading there. And, um, you know, so y'all remember Chris in your prayers. Um, also remember Chris and Dina both have the flu. And um, Chris is here alone with the flu, and Dina's over there alone with the flu. So y'all remember them. That's, um, who else was it, Lexi? I had somebody else I was supposed to... Y'all have to forgive me. My memory's getting so bad. I'm sure there's lots of people. My daughter Regina still needs prayer. Regina needs prayer, yeah. And then uh, Art and Joanne are both sick again, too. So, All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we ask that you open our hearts and minds tonight, that we might worship you properly, that we might understand your word, that we might take it to heart and put it into practice. Lord, we ask that you give us a genuine concern for the lost. We pray for our friends and loved ones who are lost, Lord, that you would call them unto you, that you would show them the light. Lord, we know that the election belongs to you, and yet we still uh, we cast the net, and it's all we can do, Lord. But we ask again that you work through your word by your spirit, through whatever vessel you see fit. We pray for those that are sick, that need help. Lord, heal them if that's be your will or through medicine or whatever your will is. We know your will's perfect. So the most important thing is we ask you to keep them in spiritual peace and calm. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to resume our study tonight in Romans 5.12. Now the section we're in runs from verse 12 to verse 21. So let's read it to start. Paul says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, parentheses, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in, one, in life by one Excuse me, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where grace ab or where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, last week we began this section and we kind of looked at it overall and we broke it down. And what we've got here is we've got a comparison. And what Paul's doing is he's not changed subjects. Nothing has changed. Keep everything in context. From the beginning of chapter 5 all the way through the end of chapter 8, Paul is dealing with the assurance of our salvation because our salvation is by faith and not by works. And what he shows us here is the absolute ultimate form of assurance. We can be certain in our salvation because we have been joined unto Christ. Never to be separated. So whatever is true of us us is true of us because we are joined unto Christ. And it's the greatest form of knowing it can never change. Look, Christ will never divorce us. He will never put us off. He'll never turn us away. And the whole context of how he started this comparison is saying this, if he loved us so much that he died
died for us when we were outside of Him in Adam, how much more will He continue to love us now that we're in Him joined to Him? And that, that's the thing that He's doing. So let's kind of uh, begin to break this down. And tonight let's deal with verse 12. Now verse 12 says, Wherefore, now immediately that tells us that this is not a new subject. This is an extension of what He's just said. And in all reality what He's saying here, it, it, it all pivots on one thing. Look in verse 10. For if, y'all see that? What he's basically saying here is, for if he did A, which is harder, certainly he'll do B, which is easier and more logical. If he did these things for us when we were enemies, how much more will he do them for us now that we're joined to him? Okay? So in verse 12, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, first thing to do is we got to talk about the first three chapters of the book of Genesis because this is where it takes us to. And there's nothing more important in all the Bible than the first three chapters of Genesis. Without those first three chapters, we don't have a clue what's going on. Because how could we explain why we even need redeeming? We wouldn't know what sin is. We wouldn't know anything about it. And because they're so important, you'll find out that it's those early chapters that are the most under attack. You know, uh, liberal theology in the, in the mid-1800s in Germany, they called it higher criticism. And what they decided to do, he, they begin to find through archaeology lots of manuscripts and full copies of the Bible from the 4th century and stuff in the Greek. And so what they begin to do is they begin to have a lot more material to examine <coughs> But they went about it in the wrong way. There's nothing wrong with textual examination. Hey, we've got to use any tool at your exposal. But what they begin to do is they begin to come at the Bible like this, say, look, our grandparents were ignorant and country folk and they believed it, but now we're more educated and we need to take a look at the Bible and we need to look at it from a little different perspective. And the first thing they want to get rid of is the miracles because that disagrees with science. And so then they begin to attack, you know, they say, well, this. And so if they can get rid of Genesis chapter 1 through 3, look what they've done. They've gotten rid of the need for redemption. And so this is why it's so important. Now, I want you all to turn to Mark 10. This really is enough to end the argument about whether Genesis is actual, literal history. Now, of course, a Bible believer says, yes, this really happened. There really was a man named Adam, and through that one man, all these things really happened. But watch what the Lord says in uh, Mark 10. <coughs> Now, the Pharisees come to him and they're, ask, they're trying to catch him in a, you know, a, a slip up, they think, and they're asking him about divorce. But watch in verse 5. Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. Because we're sinners, Moses did add the precept of divorce. But he says in verse 6, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now, you know what that tells me? that the Lord Jesus Christ believes Genesis chapter 1 is actual history, doesn't He? Matter of fact, He's the one that did it, so He would know, wouldn't He? Verse 7, He says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They sh uh, the twain shall be one flesh. They shall no more be twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So the first thing we'll do here, go, you can go back over to Romans 5, is we'll put away the idea that we're not dealing with actual history. And I know nobody in here believed that anyway, but we need to say it. Now, Paul, laid that, Paul lays down here two fundamental truths. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and draw me a timeline so I can use it. Okay. <clears throat> now, the truths Paul lays down are one, the universality of sin. In other words, Everybody knows something's wrong, don't we? So all have sinned. Every single human has sinned, Jesus Christ being the only exception. So he lays down the universality of sin, but then he also lays down another uh, principle, the universality of death. Now, are these not two principles that every human being believes? Even atheists, they won't call it sin. They hate the word sin. But they say, something is amiss. Something is spoiling life. Something causes men to want to take the easy way. Something makes us want to... 
Everybody admits this. Pagans, everybody admits it. And again, people might not call it sin, but they call it something. Now, we're going to talk about their theories about it in a minute. But when we talk about the universality of sin, every human being can see it best of all in a little child. You tell a little child, you, you say, well, that little child, you know, I think there's something in that child's nature that isn't quite right. I mean, don't we all say, well, nobody's perfect. See, that statement alone tells us something isn't quite right. But you have a little child, and you say, I think there's something amiss in that child's, you know, thinking. You know how you can prove it? Give them a law. Say, okay, child, don't do this. And what will they set out to do? <laughs> that. See, it proves sin. And sin is a thing. It's a power. It's not just what we're going to talk about in a minute, some just idea or some uh, leftover. Now. It's not. Sin is a powerful thing. It's the most powerful thing in this world outside of Christ. Okay? So the universality of sin and the universality of death. So the first thing then we'll have to do, everybody agrees with this, so now we'll say, okay, how do we account for it? Right? How do we account for the fact that sin is universal and death is universal? Y'all know we used to say, two things in life are certain, death and taxes. Now, what we were really doing was stating one thing that's absolutely certain to prove the strength of the other. Taxes aren't absolutely certain. You might could get out of it, not death. You're going to die, aren't we? You know, from the time we're born, really, you could say, well, that child's just beginning their life. Yeah, I could also say he's one day closer to death. And so that's how it is. But was it that way from the beginning? It wasn't. No. It's that way from almost the beginning. Now, why I say almost is because if we come back here and I put Adam. Did God create Adam to die? No. So then something happened that brought death in. So death was on the outside. Sin was on the outside. And that's why he says in verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, this one man was the door, this one man was the, the conduit, as by one man sin entered, you see what Paul's doing is he's using the figure of speech called personification. He's making sin like it's a person. And he says, sin slipped in the door. So then there was a point when sin was not in the world, wasn't there? So then we'd have to say, okay, then how did all of this come about? Well, here's the explanation right here. By one man's action, right? And so if we don't understand this, you know, we'll, we, nothing will be right in our theology. Let me put it that way. We'll be, we'll be wrong about every other conclusion we reach if we don't understand this. Now, all the explanations that men come up with, they fall into one of two categories, okay? Now, everybody agrees, yes, this is true. You say, okay, well then, what's the two examples, or what's the reasons that you say this is why it is? Now there's man's reasons, and then there's God's reasons. Now, it's just another way of saying there's the non-biblical view and the biblical view. Now, granted, there's a lot of variations on this one, but they're really all essentially the same to start with. Okay, so let's talk about them. Let's talk about man's first. All man's theories are based upon the assumption that man has never been perfect. They all start this way, right? And so what they essentially say is, through the process of evolution, you see, God says man started on a higher plane and fell, right? We talk about Genesis 3 and the fall. But what does evolution say? They say man started on the lowest possible plane and has been going steady upward since. Okay? Now, look at the world and tell me, do you see any sign of evolution? <laughs> Folks, we're devolving. Everything devolves. I don't care what it is. It has a decay rate, doesn't it? You go get you a new house, brand new, it's just been built, and day two, guess what? Right. You got stuff going wrong, it's heading downhill. <laughs> you buy a new car, it start, it's, it's always, everything is devolving, okay? Now, when, when we talk about these things, all his theories are this. Man has never been perfect, but we're heading in that direction, right? 
Now that's essentially what they think. That's why they thought education was the final thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've told you all this story before, but in 1912, I think it was, at Stanford University, uh, the, pr the president of the university got up and gave a speech that we had entered into the, you know, the, the golden years, they called them. The roaring twenties were out in front of us, but during this turn of the century, oil, everything's getting going. You know, it's all starting to, to get going good. And the man stood up and gave a speech, and he said, within 10 years, we're going to start turning our Navy ships. We'll decommission them and turn them into floating hospitals. And they'll go around the world healing all the people in the world, and there's going to be peace and harmony because education, man, is, is getting better and better. Well, it wasn't just a few years before World War I broke out, didn't it? Was it the worst war that had ever been fought? And they called it the Great War and the War to End All Wars. But they could only call it that for about 20 years because then World War II broke out, didn't it? And we say World War II was the greatest battle that's ever been fought. And here we are right now looking down the barrel of World War III, aren't we? See, they get worse and worse and worse. Why? Because man, we're devolving. we're devolving, folks. That's that's what's happening. Okay, so now. Uh, we're essentially just an animal is what these people teach. Okay? They say we, we came from microbes, right? And as the microbes developed, they became certain animals and splits were made and all. But essentially they say this. There's nothing wrong in a man called sin. Okay? They say man has never been perfect. All these imperfections are just the last remaining vestiges of the animal nature. Okay, that's essentially how they explain sin. Okay, and this is what they'll tell you. In other words, they say, sin is really just the remaining traces of our original animal instinct. And in a few years or a few million years, even those animal instincts, they'll be gone. Hey, now, think about this. You know, I'm going to use the example of Gina's dog. Gina has two dogs. One of them, highly intelligent. You look at it and you can see things are going on. The other one, sorry Gina, there's nothing there. Just got big bug eyes on the side of his head. They look out in this direction and nothing's going on. That dog is the epitome of an animal. That dog does what that dog desires. All that dog does is serves its own lusts. Folks, that's what every animal does. You say, yeah, but animals take care of their kids because their desire is to care for the God put that in them, right? right? So then animals have a desire and they do that which they desire, don't they? Yeah. See what they say about sin? They, they say, no, it's not sin. We've still got that animal instinct and so sometimes our animal desires just kick in. You know, that, that roughness is... And it'll eventually it'll be filtered out. Now that's how they explain sin. Okay? Therefore, they say there's no such principle as sin. It's just animal instinct. Right? But what are we told back here when God created Adam? He created all the other creatures first. And He put Adam over them to rule them, to name them. Adam had control of them. And we're told that God made Adam in His own image. Now, not that we look like God. I don't mean that. There's something about a man that is in the pattern of God. Now, there are those that say, well, it's because we're triune. We've got a body, a mind, and a spirit, just like there's God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There may be something to that, but I know one thing we do have that an animal does not have. We've got reason of worship. In other words, we have a knowledge of a Creator that is to be worshipped. Folks, animals don't have that. Now, God makes the animals to do as He pleases. But you can tell right away that God puts a lower emphasis on animals because look how easily their death comes. I mean, how many billions of sacrifices have been made? So man was made with a special purpose that the animals didn't have. Man's purpose was to know God and to glorify and worship God. Now, when he starts, Adam is completely perfect. We know he's perfect because God said he looked at everything that he had made and said it is very good, right? And I'm going to put a line here. What happened to the perfection? It fell. it fell. It was ruined. Okay, And in the ruin, the, the perfection ruined, we enter into a new state. Adam fell. Okay, Now, what we call the fall 
is really what, what Paul referred to as a fall from grace. Mm -hmm. Because what Adam really fell from, Adam fell from a direct relationship with God. So he was in a relationship with God, and the next thing you know, he's cut off from God. And every man born is cut off from God unless he is joined back by reconciliation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so this is the sin principle. Now, they say man is not positively bad. Y'all know we have this in our country. They tell us it's not sin. So-and-so did this, yes, but it's not sin. These prison sentences are too strong, they say. The person can't help it. I mean, y'all have heard all of this, haven't you? Do y'all realize we're embarking on an age when they're starting to form new language to talk about pedophiles? Mm -hmm. That they can, Right? I mean, can y'all think of a worse crime? And, you know, something specially evil about that, isn't there? But what we're being told is, no, that's just part. It's still there. They say essentially that man is not evil. There's no evil in him. He's just underdeveloped, right? And, I mean, that's what they teach. And they teach that we're heading towards a utopia when man finally reaches his plateau. Okay? Now, look out at the world. Does it look like we're making progress? <laughs> we ain't making progress. <laughs> Folks, we're not making progress. We're heading right where the Bible said we would be heading. Okay? Now, um, again, man's not uh, positively bad, they say. If these principles are true, then we ought to be able to see some proof of progress, shouldn't we? But there is no proof of progress. You don't see it. There's no proof of evolution in anything out there. All right, now, another thing, death. Man's explanations about death. Now, the Bible tells us that death is the wages of sin. In other words, God said death is a penalty. Death did not exist before this. Okay? So we can't say that death has always been. But what does mankind say? Death has always been. They say death is just a natural part of life cycle. Now, it's amazing how they want to bring man down, but essentially their, their newest theories of the last 40 years are all basically this, that we're just about like a vegetable, all of us, because they say death is just a natural part of life cycle. But it's not really a loss of anything because they say in order for there to be new life, there must be death. Now, in the vegetable world, think about it. Uh, uh, something dies and it goes to the ground and it breaks down and goes to nitrogen. Now, that nitrogen is power in life for something new, isn't it? But they treat human beings this way. They say this is how it is. This is the natural cycle. You can't have life without death. But hold on. Was there life without death back here? Yes. See, death entered in because sin entered in. Okay? <clears throat> now, um, they say death is a chemical process. Nothing's lost. In fact, they almost treat it like reincarnation. He always remember growing up, my mom would tell me about Shirley MacLaine. Remember that? That Shirley MacLaine was a nut, wasn't she? Y'all ever notice people that believe in reincarnation? None of them ever have evolved. Think about it. They all devolve in reincarnation. What was Shirley MacLaine? Queen of Sheba or something? All of them were some great thing. Have you ever heard one of them say that they were a possum in a past life or something? No. See, even their own theories are ridiculous. Reincarnation is what the pagan religions teach because they basically teach you never go out of existence. Your spirit just keeps coming back. Yeah, and so they say there really is no death. It's just part of the cycle. Folks, there's death. Death is separation. That's what it is. And God told Adam, if you disobey me, in the day you commit a sin, that same day you'll die. And that day he did die. He was separated from God. He began to be separated from his innocence more and more every day. And finally, in the end, his spirit and soul were separated from his body. Okay, so that's how death came in. Now, they say there was never a time when there was no death, no matter how far back you go. That's what they say. But what about God's explanation? Again in verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. You know, I love this. Sin entered. Paul again personifies sin. Y'all think of what he's done to sin. We tend to think of sin as things that we do. Doing the wrong thing, right? But that's a verb. 
In other words, I commit sin. Oh, I sinned. That's a verb. Here it's a noun. You see, sin is a thing. It is a power. It's a principle. And folks, the Bible says sin does things. It's not just some leftover remnant. It is a powerful force that can do things like enter. It can come through the door. You remember God told Cain that it was at his door. It also, we're told, sin can reign. Sin reigns. Folks, it takes a powerful principle to reign over someone, doesn't it? We're told that sin dominates. See, sin is a power. It's a force. Now, when it says sin entered, again, the, the, the word means to come in from without. In other words, somebody cracked the door and sin came in. Now, who cracked the door? Adam. You notice Eve is not blamed. We've talked about this already. God did not blame Eve. Eve was deceived. It doesn't mean that what she did was not a sin. It means that God was dealing with Adam as the federal head of our race. As Adam goes, the whole race goes. Okay. Now, sin reigns. Sin in the Scripture rules. Sin governs. Sin overpowers. And sin exerts its authority over people and makes them slaves. Now, are you going to tell me that's not a power? I'll tell you, sin, one, one of the things you could compare it to, in my opinion, would be this. How about drug addiction? A person is not on drugs, but all of a sudden, drugs come in the door into their life, and what happens? Lose control. There is a new power that grabs hold of that person, and it dominates them. It reigns over them, and it is powerful, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I thank God that I've never tried these drugs that they say today. If you try it one time, you're liable just hooked for life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is a person was one way, and then something comes into their life, and now they're totally another way. Folks, that's what happened to Adam. Everything changed by his one act of disobedience. All right? Go back over to uh, Genesis 2, and let's just read how God said it. All right, in Genesis 2, 15, the Lord God took the man... He's perfect now. He put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. You notice God had work for Adam to do before sin. I know people that say work is the result of sin. No, it's not. God had something for man to do. Folks, we need to have stuff to do. Okay? We, we do. God made us to work. He, one of the things I learned when I started preaching is I had to find some kind of outlet for physical work. I, I just I learned that right away because I, all my life I've worked done physical work and when you preach it's a lot of study and it's a lot of drive and that sort of thing but I found out I have got to have something I can do physically because a man needs to work you really do Wayne knows what I mean huh Mark y all, y all, you men know what I mean even you women know me and Jean have got an affliction where we got to make a list and we got to work on it Right? Nothing better than crossing off that list, is there, that it's accomplished. But the whole point being is, he had something for Adam to do, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He says to him, verse 16, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. You talk about uh, free rain. Can you all imagine what was in that garden? I mean, the fruits and the, I mean, just unbelievable avocados and cherries and just everything. And he says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, notice it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the tree of good and evil. Men have tried to explain this tree by f figuring out what the fruit is. The fruit ain't the issue. Look, there's even people that today want to say that, it, well, it was a grape and it was fermented, so he got drunk and that was the sin. Folks, there was no fermentation. There was no death. Fermentation is, is death. It says, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So that tells me something. Sin is a thing, right? I'm going to put it here. Sin is a power. And that power produces a result. What did God say He would do when man sinned? Death. Folks, death is God's penalty for sin. 
And the point Paul's going to make in this chapter, we're going to take our time with it now, but in this verse especially is, death is the penalty for Adam's sin. And the whole reason he's trying to do this is because what he's doing, he's getting us to understand how God can deal with a whole group of people based on one. And you say, well, that ain't fair. It's the, by far fair. Because God dealt with Adam this way. One man acted for everybody. He's able to deal with us this way. And that's the point Paul's making. And look, anybody you would ask, would you rather be tested on your, right now, let God test you individually, or would you rather be tested in Adam? I'd rather have Adam do it for me. He had a better chance than me. Look, Adam was perfect. He was innocent, and he had one temptation. You and I are imperfect, we're no longer innocent, and we're bombarded with temptation. So it was a lot more fair of God to put man through the test in perfection than it would be to test us, isn't it? But if He also tested each one of us individually, and our sins were the result that, that or the thing that resulted in our death, then also He would have to deal with us individually by salvation. Our works would have to see it's not how God's doing. Paul is showing us that God has, is, is basically looking at two acts. The act of Adam and the act of Christ. And thank God for it. Okay? Now, um, let's see. All right. Sin is a choice of self over God. Now, that's how it is. It wasn't there in the beginning. Did Adam have a choice to make when God told him, don't eat from that tree? Yeah. And so Adam made a choice, and the thing that he chose brought about two things that were not there before. His choice was the sin. The result is death. And you know, God made this so clear to him. What's the very first death in the Bible? You know, we instantly say Abel, but there's one before Abel. Oh, it was the skins of the animals. Mm -hmm. The very second Adam and Eve sin, God steps in, and what does He show them? <sighs> death is the result. And they watched death for the first time. Folks, they had no idea about death. It wasn't in the world. Those animals were not made to die. Adam and Eve were not made to die. Look, Adam was put, as it were, in a position of probation almost. There was something Adam could have gained. Adam was not glorified. Adam could have advanced the stage because there was another tree called the tree of life. And he said if he eats of that tree, he'll live forever. And so what we see then is we see Adam in a period of probation, and what did he do? He failed the test. And here comes Christ in his probation, and he passes the test. All right, so this is what, uh, again, what Adam did. Now, sin entered, and it's like an invasion. Sin entered into the world, and death also entered. Now, sin produces a fall from a higher place to a lower place, whereas science says we're coming from a lower place to a higher place. We're not. Um, another thing you can say about sin, sin is a reigning principle, but it's also a corruption. You know, the Bible uses the example of leaven to, to show us how sin works. All right? You've got pure flour. Get a speck of yeast in it, and what happens? Off it goes. The, it, off it goes. You can't stop it. Is there such a thing as stopping it? You know the only thing you can do to stop the leavening process? Bake it. Put it in the fire and kill it. You see what God's going to do with sin? Yeah. Folks, sin is like kudzu. Now, we understand that here, don't we? Huh. I'll tell you another one, jap grass. Yes. Huh? Lexi showed me some, she said, oh, there's some pretty grass coming up out there. I looked at it, I said, you better kill that right now. <laughs> Seriously. It's, co co what do they call it, kogon? Kogon? It's got a root system. You can, it's, it's unbelievable. You all know, I've been told that they brought those things from Japan for highway to, because... But what happens when you get a little kudzu comes into the garden? The whole garden. Now look how God has put these things so simple for us to understand. What did God do when Adam sinned regarding the earth? <coughs> he put a curse on it and He said, thorns and thistles is now what it's going to do. He was showing us what sin was going to do. Essentially, the sin came in the garden and it's like kudzu went around the world. Okay, that's the whole picture. And death went around the world as well. Alright, so sin again is a corruption. And the doctrine of the fall is the only explanation for the world's condition today. 
You cannot tell me why someone wants to do that which they know is harmful to them just because they're not supposed to do it. That's not logical. A dog does not want to do that which is harmful to them. If they do it, they don't realize it's harmful, and when they realize it's harmful, they run the other way. But what about us humans? Folks, y'all remember as a teenager, what's the thing you wanted to do? Whatever you weren't supposed what to do. What you were not supposed to do. And you know, has it really changed much? Mm -hmm. What is the thing we want to eat most? Sweets. What we know is not good for us. What's the thing we, we, we just, this is our nature, okay? It is a power and it reigns over us. Can any human break it by his own strength? Yeah. Is there anything stronger in the world than sin? One thing. Y'all flip over, back over to Romans 5. Thank God there's another principle in the world. <coughs> Romans 5.20 Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The grace of God is stronger than sin. Only the grace of God can break the, the principle of sin. Okay? So now, uh, this death by sin, let's deal with this. Sin set off a series of chain reactions, really. Adam's one sin was like a chain reaction and an atom bomb, and it's still exploding today. It just took off. Okay? Death is the penalty for sin. It was not part of the original creation. Look, death got Adam cut off from God, cut off from innocence, cut off from rulership because he was the God of the earth. I mean, he had domain over it. Who became the God of, the, of this world that day when Adam fell? The devil. the devil did. And who has reigned over Adam ever since? The devil. the devil. And what is the principle by which the devil keeps Adam in check? Sin. Hey, look, it's, it's, I once heard an interview one time with uh, Rockefeller, Rothschild, I forget one of them, they were talking and they said something that caught my attention and I thought about it and it made sense. They said, you don't control the people by controlling the money, you control the people by controlling the debt. And I thought about that and I thought, now that don't make any sense. What he meant was this, you've got to get them in debt and then you've got them. And I thought about the Tennessee Ernie uh, Ford song, remember? 16 I, owe I owe my soul to the company store. They would have a they would have a coal uh, you know mine or whatever it was, and they would open a store there with all the supplies people needed. These people would come from wherever to get a job, and they would go to work in the coal mine. But where'd they get their supplies? At the store. So when they first got there, the first thing they did was went into the store, and they give them a line of credit. And once they got the line of credit, guess what? Interesting. Here come the, they got them. Folks, that's how the, the, our system works. I mean, most of the people in the, this country live week to week. They are, and you say, yeah, but that's not sin, that's life. Yeah, but think of that in the same way. The devil could not change Adam. The devil could not curse what God blessed. But if the devil could get Adam to turn his back on God, he knew God would turn his back on Adam. So sin is the, the thing like debt that he uses to control man. Okay? Does that make sense with y'all? Alright, all right, now go over to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says it uh, in a different way, but it's still, it's a good picture. In 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the resurrection. And he says uh, in verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But watch what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You see, he's making sin like it's a snake, right? And he says, the sting... Uh, uh, the sting here that's going to get you, notice, the sting of death is sin. All right? If the snake didn't bite you, the poison couldn't hurt you. How could death hurt man unless man sins? You see what he's saying there? Like a snake has the ability to kill you, but it can't kill you unless it bites you. The bite is the way the poison gets in you, right? How does death come into the world? 
by sin. Sin was the bite and death was the poison that came. So this is the example he's trying to paint for us. Now, Adam was not created uh, immortal. Let me say this. Adam was created to live forever, but he was not created glorified. Hey, is the, can we be certain that Adam could have reached a higher plane? Yes, he could have. He was an earthly creature, right? right? And there was the tree of life. He could have. God said, when they sin, he said, I'm going to take them out of the garden for their own good. He said, lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. So Adam could have gained immortality as far as a glorified, you know, in, in other words, in other words, for him to go up to God, he would have had to be changed, right? right. So then Adam... Adam was created, not glorified, but folks, Adam was perfect. There was no bad thing in him, nothing. What's the only thing that was in him that you could say made sin possible? Choice, will. Choice, will. God gave him will, right? And did God make him sin? No. But what did God prove about a creature that's not God? They're going to do what's self... In other words, you can't create God. God is that perfect and that glorious and that loving. He cannot create a creature that is God, otherwise He's not God. So He created the perfect thing that He could create, as perfect as you can get, and gave it a power of choice. And what did it choose? Self. Now that's the shortest definition of sin in the Bible, self. We're made to glorify God, and yet what did Adam say that day? I'm going to do what I want to do. Now me and you got the same problem? Y'all yeah. know we do. We ate up with it, aren't we? Hey, so this is how it came. Now Adam had no corruption in him by creation. The corruption entered in from without. How did corruption enter into Adam? We're told that sin entered into the world. Okay, let's, let's deal with the world. Now, the world is, is there's several words, Greek words, that you're translated to world, okay? And if you ever want, get you a Strong's or something to look up the word world and look at the different meanings because one times, or sometimes the word world refers to an age, right? Like the end of the world. Other times it refers to the actual earth, right? But most of the time in our Bible, the Greek word is cosmos, and it refers to the order of things. Did God set things? things in order. Yes. And who was over the order? Adam. But y'all know when he sinned, an entirely new world came into existence. It's the current world that we all live in. And who is the God of this world? Satan. And therefore the Lord Jesus Christ says that a saved person is in this world, but he's not of this world. Right? So how did sin enter into this? Sin existed. It had to exist to enter in. Well, how did sin enter into the current world and order of mankind? Somebody had already sinned, hadn't they? That's right. Satan. Satan had already sinned. Sin was already in existence in the angelic realm. And so sin entered in through the temptation of Eve, Satan, you know, brought it into the forefront, but Adam did it by choice. And that's why his choice is imputed to us. He was our representative and he chose to, to do self. Okay? So, so this is again how sin entered into the world. Now, sin passed upon all men. Does anybody doubt that? No, we know that to be true, don't we? You know, there's a principle God put in Scripture. Go back in Genesis 1. This is the very first law of nature that you can really find in the Bible. Something God set in stone here. In Genesis 1.11 it said, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. In other words, everything is going to bring forth after its kind. Now, we deal with this constantly, don't we? He, I'm not going to say any names, but she's sitting right there. Got a big uh, plan for cucumbers. 
All right? Was it seeds you got them from? Or no. No? Plants. Plants, okay. So we're going to have sliced cucumbers all the time and got plans for these cucumbers. Uh -huh. But y'all know what? Somebody bought pickling cucumber plants. Uh -oh. You know the little pickles about that long? They're good tasting little ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, how come... Gina can't get cucumbers from them pickle cucumbers. Because the seed is not for the regular, it's for the little. God made it where everything brings forth after its kind. Scientists have done everything they can to change that, and they can't change it. Folks, it's set in stone. If you plant a tomato seed, you're going to get a tomato. Because the way the seed it works, it, look, it's called, hey, I don't want to say this, it's called uh, seminal theology. In other words, what's in the seed is in the fruit, right? Now, how did sin pass upon all men? Same way. Through the Same seed. way, through the seed. And yet what Paul's talking about here when he says sin passed upon all men, He's actually not talking about that, although that's true. In other words, Adam's sin nature did pass through his seed into every one of us. But y'all know that's not the sin that's reckoned unto us that Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about two men. One man Adam, one man Christ. He's not saying that we die because we commit sins. He's saying, look, sin was put to our account because of one man. Now, you got to make sure it's true that sin passes, right? And it's true. We all sin like that. But that in the context is not what he's saying because that wouldn't prove his point. Remember the point he's wanting to make. We've got to always keep in context. All right, he's telling me the certainty of what I have by union with Christ. And he's using the certainty of my union with Adam to prove it. Now, what is the thing we're dealing with here? It's imputation. God imputes things to us, right? How does God give us the righteousness of Christ? Imputation. He joins us to Christ and takes everything that's true of Christ and accounts it to us. Why are you and I dying? Because God took everything that's true of Adam and imputed it to us. And Paul's going to prove that. He's going to prove that it's Adam's one sin that brought sin on us and not our sins. He's going to prove it by saying, first off, innocent people die, babies die. They're not dying for their sins. They're dying because Adam's sin has been imputed to the human race. He's also going to say the definition of sin is transgression of the law. Right? Well, how could there be a transgression of the law when there's no law? And yet they still died. You see, Paul is proving that all the human race suffers because of the failure of Adam. Adam's failure has been put to the account of all of us. And immediately someone would say, that's not fair. You better bless God that it's so. Because by that same process, he's able to deal with one man, Christ, and save us. Again, folks, if he dealt with us individually, he would have to deal with us individually on merit, and we wouldn't have a chance. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, what's true of the seed is true of the fruit. Now, by one man, again, that's Paul's point. The relationship is a parallel one. Okay? What's true of our relationship with Adam is true of our relationship with Christ. The only difference is the magnitude. Adam committed one sin, and that passed upon all men. Christ died for all our sins and passes upon every believer. It's a, it's a perfect parallel. Our spiritual union with Christ is proven by our spiritual union with Adam. He, look, the Puritans called this our mystical union. And I think that's a good way to look at it. A mystical union means there's something mysterious about it, isn't there? This is hard for us to understand. It really is. But you know, there's several mystical unions in, in the Scripture. And uh, really it all hinges on, if y'all go back to Romans 5.10, y'all flip over there. I know we've already said this, but we'll say it again. Again in verse 10 when he says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be, we shall be saved by His life.
Now, it's unfortunate that the translators used the word by there. There's a much better word in his life. It's the same Greek word, okay? Matter of fact, in my, uh, if you've got, depending on what Bible you got, it might have a note in a column. So really what he's saying is, for if when we were enemies, that means when we were in Adam, okay, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, by means of his son's death, much more than being reconciled, we shall be saved in his life. If we were in the death of Adam, everything else is true of us in the life of Christ. And if God did these wonderful things for us while we were in Adam, how much more will God treat us while we're in Christ? And it's the in Christ. That's the whole point of this passage. And again, the, the, they call it the mystical union that the Puritans did. You know, there are three mystical unions in Scripture that I put down here. And I'm, we'll just talk about them real quick. How about the union that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? We can't explain it. No man has ever really explained it. All we've got to do is believe it. They are three distinct persons, and yet they're one. That is a mystical union that you and I just can't really grasp, okay? There's another, the mystical union that existed between the man Christ and the Son of God. Was He fully the Son of God? Yes. Was He fully human? Yes. You know, the council at Chalcedon, I've told you all before, they, they, to fight the, this was way back in the, you know, 5th century, but to fight the heresies that were coming up, they said, look, He's fully God and fully man, without controversy, without mixing, without division, without separation. In other words, it is a mystical union of God and man in a person, and we just really can't explain it. We don't need to explain it. We just need to believe it. But there's another that will help us some. There's the mystical union of Christ with His church. It's just the same kind of union. Y'all flip over to Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, verse 21... You know, I've thought several times, we were getting close to this at, at class at Gina's house, and I always thought, you know what, I am not going to read 21, because if I read 21 and Roy's there, he's going to say, stop, what was that? Say it again. <laughs> Him and Sabrina like picking with each other. Remember one time James, I read it in, here, and James said, Troy, would you read verse 21 again? Okay. 21 says, uh, about the wives, submitting yourselves one another in the fear of God, verse 22 I meant, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now that's a command, that's not a suggestion. But y'all know what, there's a command in here for the husband to love his wife. Hey, Mr. Bailey's got a great, you want to talk to somebody about seeing that verse, Mr. Bailey said he just realized one day that that wasn't a suggestion, it was a command, and he said, well, I better get on with it. And he got on, he still loves her today. Yes. Now, verse 23, he says, for or because the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, he's not saying just the head as in charge. He's saying he's the head of the body. Y'all think about the union between head and body. It's one, isn't it? And yet the head's making all the choices. And you say, yeah, but the head's doing everything. Yeah, but the nerves go down and the muscles react. Folks, this thing works in ways doctors think they understand. They don't really get it yet. He says in 24, he's the Savior of the body, 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. How much should we love them? Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How much should we love our wives? Lay down your life for. I tell you what's even harder, live your life for. Think about that. I think many times about things I'm doing, and I think, man, what a bad example I'm setting for Lexi. It just, it'll hit me. I'm doing something when I ought to be doing something else, and I think to myself, you know, what, what am I saying? In other words, it's harder to live for someone, isn't it? So he says in verse 26, 
He died for the church that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. Folks, that's the washing of His bride preparing her for the day of, of union. The day of unions in the, in the resurrection. But here He says we're going to be washed. Now what's the means that He uses to wash us? The Word of God. The Word. How does it wash us? Folks, we take it and we apply it to our life. We learn, we see, we, we, we cleanse ourselves. He says that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He, we've got a, uh, one of the young ladies at Gina's class, uh, Julie's daughter, is getting married. And I heard him talking about she's picking out her wedding dress the other day. I asked her at class, I said, what do you want your wedding dress to look like that day? She said, well, clean and white. Yeah. You see, our righteousness is that. Now, our righteousness has been imputed to us, but you realize in that day, we're not only going to stand in His imputed righteousness, we're going to stand with all our works in Christ. What do we want our works to look like? We want them to be clean and white. Now, will they all be? He's going to wash all the imperfections away that day. Whatever's gold, gold, silver, and precious stones, in other words, whatever's done to the glory of God properly, will produce a reward. It's like the bride gets to wear her gold, silver, and precious stones. Whatever's wood, hay, and stubble burns up. It won't make it through. He says, 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You see, when he brings in the body there, he tells you what he means by the head. He don't just mean the chief, he means the head. Now he says in 29, No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now folks, that's a mystical union. And yet it's true. How true is it? It's just as true as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being one. He says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. See, he went right back to Genesis to show us this is a picture. Marriage was instituted by God back there to picture Christ's work over here. Christ didn't come along and do this and say, well, Hey, that's a lot like that. Christ set that up back there to show forth this. Now he says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's a mystical union. Do you think Christ will ever break that union? You know, there are those that say Paul made this up. We'll have to get to this next class, but I, I put these in there. Lots of people say Paul is, oh, that's Pauline theology. He's the one. He was a Pharisee and all this. But y'all think about it. I put some examples in here. We'll cover them next class, Lord willing, but I'm going to say them real quick. The Lord Jesus Christ taught this same mystical union. He said it this way in John. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Is the branch attached to the vine? You know, the, the branch produces fruit, but it does it because of the vine. The sap, everything flows through the vine. He said, you've got to be in me. That's a mystical union. All right. Also, he did it regarding the Lord's Supper. Remember, he said he was the bread of life, and we've got to eat him, and what does he do? He becomes a part of us. Same with the living water. Drink it, and what happens? What we eat and drink becomes part of us. In some mystical union way, Christ is that much, you know, uh, enjoined unto us. I had another example he used was the foundation and the building. He said, Christ is the foundation, you're the building, right? All right, how about this? Foundation right now is under us. We all agree there's a foundation there? Yeah. Do you look at it as a separate thing? You look at it as part of the house. You know, an amazing thing about being part of the house is not only is the house part with the foundation, but each brick's part of the other brick. So we're not only one with Christ, we're one with each other. All right. He also used the example, the head and the body. And then Christ Himself in Mark 10, we've already read it, used the example of the husband and the wife. Two become one, don't they? So again, what Paul's doing before we close is this. Paul is taking a known thing, what we know about Adam to be true. In fact, what all men know to be true about us. We got certain things from Adam, and we didn't do anything to deserve it. We didn't ask for it, but it has been put to our account, and it's there. We all agree with that? Yeah. If we can understand that, he says, now then, apply that to your union with Christ.
If you understand your union with Adam and how everything that was true of your head passed unto you by no choice of your own, he said, now you'll be able to understand how Christ is able to see you righteous because God has joined you unto him. And by the successful work of your federal head, everything has been passed to the new race. Now, how certain does that make our assurance? That's the greatest form ever. Folks, if we have been joined unto Christ to where he becomes part of us and we're part of him, how are you going to separate that? You can't. Okay, so we'll stop there and we'll pick it up next time. There's so much in these verses that really is important to theology on a, on a real basic level. All right, is there any questions about any of that tonight? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You for this mystical union that we see in Scripture. Father, we may not understand it. In fact, we know we don't, but we do believe it. Lord, we know that You have joined us unto Christ by faith. We ask that You open our hearts and minds to think of ourselves in our head and not in our own self. Lord, when Satan comes at us with doubts and fears, let us stand on the Scripture saying that we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore have passed from death unto life, and that life will never be taken from us, Lord. You promised its eternal life. Please help us stand in this assurance. Forgive us when we fail to glorify You in all things and be thankful in all things. Help us to do better, Lord. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen.